As the lone halibut flaps on the beach, Josh and Adam prepare a stretcher for the trip to the fish hospital. Fish hospital. Fish hospital. Josh, <laughs> if engineering were a block of fine cheese, you would be that slightly runny camembert that the cat ate Hello. in the back room. Welcome to Engineer vs. Designer. The podcast. For engineers. Designers. Makers, bakers, and former CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies. I'm Josh. And I'm Adam. And today we'll be talking with the magical, mysterious, nebulous, and never nefarious mm. Carl Bass of Autodesk Chief Executive fame. Wow. And uh, if you weren't aware, Carl just announced he'll be stepping down as CEO, or I guess he already has, mm -hmm. uh, stepped down as CEO of Autodesk to spend more time with his robots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there are plenty of really good interviews on that subject already uh, out on the interwebbies, and uh, we'll be sure to link to those in the post. Yep, but uh, this is, we think, a uh, third time Maybe we've the had second him on the or show. Third, Nick, I, I, thought, I think it's the third. I think we've spoken yeah. to him twice before. Uh, plus, yeah. there's, there's just so much stuff out there about Carl's uh, time at Autodesk that we're going to have to... Uh, Resort to some Hail Mary questions if we want to do anything on this new episode. All right, so let's do it. So, so uh, my daughter is three years old. Is it too early for her to work in a machine shop? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, the other, the other day I made my machine <laughs> shop look like a nursery school when uh, <laughs> I had cleaned out all the coolant out of this machine. And then I put the thing back that receives it, but I didn't put it quite in the right place. And I dumped 50 gallons of coolant onto the floor. <laughs> so it looked just like a nursery oh, school. It's the same kind of mistakes. So, so they, Right, exactly. They, you know, a three-year-old couldn't have done any worse than I did. <laughs> well said. Oh, that's great. All right. Well... Today we are talking with Carl Bass, <laughs> maker and former CEO of Autodesk. <laughs> Welcome back, Carl. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Let's see, we, we had you on Engineer vs. Designer way back in 2014. I think that's about right. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, uh, yeah three years ago. Three years ago, something like that. And, and there are tons of questions that have been on our minds since then. Uh, we've been going back and forth about it. Uh, and uh, the important question is this. If you had the power to stick your arms out to your sides and spin around so fast that you could fly... Like a helicopter. Yeah. But in exchange for that privilege, you had to give human helicopter rides at birthday parties every Saturday for the rest of your life. Would you do it? In an instant. <laughs> I kind of thought so. That's an easy one, actually. I'd ride. I'd ride, Carl. I'd, yeah. I'd that, kind of sound, I mean, what? That's, that sounded wrong, but you can't. I live, I live in a place where getting from place to place is such a pain in the neck. Oh, right. Ah, uh, yeah. But those of us who live in the and city. That definitely makes sense then. Uh, so we, we've been hearing uh, some rumors, too, and there's word that you've spent the last few weeks building a small robot army uh, from your old working computer, from your old work computer and wood scraps, wearing nothing but a leather shop apron and a pair of chaps. Is is that true or rumors? You know, that's actually better than some of the other rumors. <laughs> it's closer. <laughs> it's way closer to the truth than some of the other rumors. Out there. <laughs> what have you actually been doing with your time? Um, what have I actually been doing? So I did just finish renovating my metal shop, and so I did this nice. huge construction project over the summer. Started started in July, and we just finished. And so um, my metal shop has now expanded considerably. Yeah, that's quite a project. That's really cool. So when you do that, I mean. When you say we, I mean, it's clearly you hired contractors and stuff to help you, right? Um, and did you design the, did you write the, did you draw up something? Did you, I mean, how did, how, what was that process yeah, like yeah. for you? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so, I mean, I've done, I've done a ton of both the design and the construction, but I had a contractor. There's also the, there's a friend of mine. She shares my wood shop with me. And so she kind of project managed it. And, but, you know, like right now we're busy building a crazy folded metal staircase. We, we had designed the whole thing. I'm busy turning on the CNC machine, a whole bunch of hardware for the office and kitchen. Wow. So, the, I mean, the, there's lots of fabrication going on right now because we're kind of, the construction was, you know, we uh, had to reinforce it for seismic. We gutted it to the floor and built it back up. We put solar on top, so now the thing runs. And so far, my electricity bills are zero, which is wow. awesome. Um, oh, yeah, I can weld as much as I want, and I don't. 
That's crazy. Electricity. That is fantastic. Wow. I mean, and that that's classic CEO behavior right there. So, I mean, delegate, <laughs> delegate, right? Yes. Well, it's this weird mix of I delegate some and I do, and I get to do a whole bunch of the stuff. So, you know, I was, I was involved in the design. A good friend of mine uh, was the architect on this, was a guy named Jeff McGrew, who, you know, runs that business called Because We Can, um, ah. an architectural design build firm. And so he's very much mm-hmm. on the, you know, hands-on fabricating side as well as on the design side. So Jeff and I worked together with Betts, who's the woman who runs the shop, and we got that all. So the whole shop's back together again, and now we're just, you know, building fun things in there. Right now, what I, I have a second floor loft in there, so I've been toying around with uh, building a fire pole. And I've, I've also, I've also, um, I have these two robotic, you know, kind of robots I'm, I'm working on. These two crazy machines. So I'm doing a little bit of that. As as I get as I get older, th- you know, I I more and more realize that I'm not any longer going to be asked what I'm going to be when I grow up. Like I'm pretty much I'm pretty much stuck. And I'm starting to realize that I am not, in fact, going to be Carl Bass when I grow up, and that makes me very sad. Oh, come on! <laughs> Especially <laughs> considering all the things that you're saying right now. You should be very happy. Um, no, no, no. But it is true. I mean, a, cu- a couple things happen. Number one is you realize, like, you know, you are what you are, and your life is what you make it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing is, you know, at a certain point, and you guys, fortunately, are not there yet, you realize you've probably, you know, already worked more days. Then you're going to work in the future. Wow! Yeah. So they start, mm-hmm. they start becoming oh, yeah. more precious, you know, when you realize, you know, you're in, you're in the second half of the ball game, right? You know, and so you, yeah, like, preach it, brother. You start cherishing the days a little bit more. No kidding. Well, we want to get uh, more into your building and projects you've been working on. We want to catch everyone up, though. Uh, everybody was uh, pretty surprised when you left. Understandably, uh, Rupinder over at engineer.com, engineering.com covered a lot uh, in his interview with you. Uh, we'll post that and won't grill you about it. But, you know, in, in broad strokes, uh, you've been playing this for a while and not because of anything that happened at Autodesk right now. Uh, nobody's upset with anybody and you're happy, healthy, loving life in the shop. Does that cover it? Can you break down, uh, sort of give us a brief overview of how everything happened? That's kind of, I mean, the short story. the short story is about, you know, starting a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted to go spend you know, more time building some of my contraptions um, and, you know, working in the shop. And, you know, I had done, I'd been CEO for a while. And so I started talking to the board about it. And then about a little, about a year and a half ago, I had said to the board, you know, it's, it's time. Let's, you know, let's start the process for real of putting someone else in place. And uh, mm-hmm. then, then we got these uh, activists on the board. Um, you know, right. who, who came, you know, who came, who came along and I felt it was really unfair to either look for a CEO or have a new CEO take over. Um, mm-hmm. when they were on the board, I didn't think you'd find the best CEO. Uh, and I thought it was an unfair burden for a new CEO. To have you mean to, just because the activist investors would make it hard for whoever was coming yeah, in? Yeah, they're just, they're, um, if, you know, they're you a little know. bit, they're a little bit stupid and a pain in the ass and short sighted. And, uh, you know, when, when you're, when you're starting a new job, who needs it? Who needs that looking over your shoulder criticizing? You know, right. Right. I mean, there's enough work, you know, and most likely the person who takes this job will be a first time CEO or certainly a first time, you know, public company CEO of this scale. Um, so they, you know, they, they don't need backseat drivers with, you know, bad ideas. And so I, I just decided that. It was more important for me that the you know that we got a really great CEO to take over, and I thought I could you know best help that by not leaving, and so I stayed for you know twelve fifteen months more than you know kind of the original plan, and then uh, wow. basically cut a deal with them to say you know I want to I want to leave um, I want you to leave. We have kind of a mutual hostage situation going on, and here's the way we can resolve it. <laughs> I'll leave, you leave, and, you know, and we'll select the next CEO. And, you know, that's I think crazy. that's the best thing for Autodesk. So, you know, and, and the last, you know, one of the funny things about, you know, a job like mine was I liked my job, 
it's just like with any job, you know, you kind of, you're trading your time. And I just felt like I had other things I wanted to do. So I don't, you know, I don't regret having spent the last year and, you know, it really helped the company. I think it's in a, you know, I think it's in a better place. It'll attract a better CEO and they'll have a better chance to succeed. So, um, uh, you know, I'm glad I did it. I I would have preferred my original, you know, calendar, you know, that original timeline would have suited me better, but you know, it is what it is. So now let's get into what we really wanted to talk with you about, which is uh, the stuff you've been building in your shop, right? I mean, uh, you've told us about a couple of things that you've been working on, but uh, but what else? What what else have you got going on? Yeah, so I'm doing a couple of things. So one is I'm working with a group of people who are just, you know, all volunteering their time. So we're doing this as a hobby. So I had, my son had built this electric go-kart a few years ago. And I remember. He, he's off at college now, so I can screw around with his go kart. And uh, what we're do, what we're doing is we're using machine learning, so kind of these you know kind of deep neural nets to make the go kart autonomous. So up until now, I had made the go kart you know work as a radio control thing, as well as being able to follow like waypoints from GPS. And now the last part is to truly make it, uh, you know, autonomous and drive around a racetrack. Um, and we're, and, we're, and so where are you gathering the what? data for that? So that's really cool. It's a cool thing. So the two places we're insane. gathering data is we're doing it at one of these, you know, racetracks. So it turns out that every, every person who goes on the racetrack seems to take a GoPro with them. So there's thousands of hours of video of people driving these tracks available on YouTube. So that's one place. And then the second thing is one of the guys is has built a video game and uh, from, you know, available public data has built a racetrack into the game so you can drive it and train it that way. So the combination of the synthetic data coming from the game, as well as the videos on YouTube is how, is how we're training the net. Wow. So the more that you play the game, the more the incredible. net learns, uh, learns yeah. how to drive the track. Yep. And then, hmm. in the, yeah, that I think is... we're like, we're three weeks away from going to the track and doing it. So I got a bunch of work. And you think it's going to work? <laughs> that remains to be seen. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, there, there were actually uh, ways we could have done it with greater confidence of success, but that wasn't the point of this thing. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of real companies who are working really hard on autonomous vehicles for, you know, trying to get to the 99.9% mm -hmm. of the cases. Um, and we said instead, you know, we're just starting from scratch. And so we're going to do this whole thing through machine learning instead of kind of conventional programming and see, and see if we can pull it off. You know, at the oh, end of the day, that's a great approach, it, it is just a go, it's just a go-kart on a big racetrack. So, you know, we're, we're hopefully not going to hurt anybody. If that it is work. that is crazy and amazing, and I can't wait to see the videos of that. And I'm sure that uh, that once you once you publish those, you'd be sure to send us links so that we can. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely this, send uh, them to you. This, so, uh, yeah, it, for it, sure. It's like the first or second weekend in April we're going up to do this, so it 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 should, it should be a hoot. So we, I mean, we've seen photos of your shop uh, or the old one. Yeah, uh, we haven't yet had a chance to visit. Uh, hint, hint. Uh, you definitely yeah, when, look whenever you, whenever you guys are out here. The new, the new, the new shop <laughs> but, is awesome. I'm happy, happy to show you the new shop. You know, it's, well, I will definitely excellent. take you up on that the next time we're up there. So, so I mean, you've got a lot of cool stuff, a lot of amazing tools. Um, so, two questions: What is your favorite tool that you have? Favorite machine tool that you have? And uh, what's your favorite one that you don't have and that you would like to? So, kind of the fa the favorite one I have is probably the water jet. It's a toss up. Um, mm. it's, it's somewhere between the water jet and I have this gigantic um, uh, press brake. So I got a 135 ton press brake. So you know, and it'll oh, bend wow. half. It bends half inch steel easily. <laughs> um, wow. it, it's actually interesting. People always are amazed. After you bend it, you can burn your fingers by touching the metal. It gets that hot. Dang. Yeah. I mean, when you do, if you just think about it, it makes sense. But uh, so mm -hmm. I love my water jet. I love I love the press brake, but probably the water jet would win out. You know, one of the one, you know, a couple of the things I'm working on are uh, one machine that's doing uh, metal 3D printing. I may have told you I was taking this MIG welder and turning it into a machine that prints stuff. 
Um, yeah. And because I want, I want a metal printer, and I don't want to spend, you know, half a million dollars for one of the laser yeah. printing powdered metal machines. Um, and then the one, the one I've been um, just drawing up lately and thinking about is one of the things that <laughs> I'm finding dismaying is all my CNC machines seem to do all the really fun part of the job, and they leave me with all the shit work. So I have to sand and grind <laughs> and polish. And it seems yeah. crazy that they take all the fun part, and you know, the, the, the robots are stealing the fun, and I want some of the fun. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking <laughs> of a robot that's actually going to sand and grind and polish. So in your mind, in your mind, is that like, is that like an arm uh, with a with a spin polisher on the end of it, or you know, what, yeah, what's your... yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some, you know, there, there's some end effector, there's some actuator out there that 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 does it. It depends a lot on the geometry, and you know kind of just how curved the geometry is. So I think you could do something very different for flat surfaces versus curved surfaces. But yeah, it, it, but you're it still going like, to, you're still going to have to write some G code. You're going to have, you're going to have to set up some kind of machine paths and have this yeah. thing like know where the, where it's going in advance. So this is a part of your machining operation. I mean, the, 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 one of the things that we have all learned, to, well, actually some people who work in a shop can grind and sand things well, and some can't. You know, so what you don't want to do is make the valleys, you know, and the troughs deeper and follow the imperfections in the work. And it's kind of interesting. You know, some people have the skill to do it and some don't. So I'm hoping to teach my robot how to have the skill to actually make really, you know, high quality sanding and grinding. And so huh. you need some kind of force feedback involved in that. Right. So you're going to be able to both sense and grind with the same tool. Yep, exactly. And so I've run some experiments, but <laughs> that became the thing because I realized, like, if I make one of these things with the CNC, it's cool. And then someone says, "Can you make another or a third?" And I go, "Yeah, but man, that's a lot of that's a lot of grinding and polishing. <laughs> I don't want to do that much grinding and polishing." <laughs> and so if I had a machine, I, 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 if my robot would do it for me, I'd be much happier. I think that's a life. That's just a. That's just a. That's a T-shirt right there. If my robot would do it for me, yeah. I'd be much happier. Exactly. So. That, so, so, so I'm doing I'm doing a little bit of that, and so th that's actually really been fun, and uh, you know, and you know, and building the and building the fun things, setting up a shop is kind of fun, um, you know, for a while, and right now it's still in the fun stage of, you know, we're bu building crazy carts and you know these the staircase and fire poles and all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm having a really good time with that, and then. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I've been doing a. I've actually I've actually been doing a little bit of work, believe it or not. Um, I'm, I'm actually doing a bunch of uh, advising to the guys down at Google. So I've been uh, I've been talking to them about some of the projects in X and some of the stuff going on in Alphabet. So you know, I'd kind of say wow. you know, kind of a day, kind of a day a week. I'm uh, I'm spending mm -hmm. with them. Nice, nice. So we've also uh, seen some some of the cool stuff you've made with your kids. Not everything, uh, Willie and Willie and Jake. Thank uh, the there's the rocket ship uh, that uh, you built with them when you were little, and then the go, go kart you just talked about. As what were some of the inspirational moments making with your kids? Uh, well, the. The rocket ship was cool because that, that was a project that was done with Jake. And he said, oh, I want to make a rocket ship. And so we took some Saturday and we went down to the shop. And we spent most of the day turning a big block of wood into a rocket ship. And then we painted it. Huh. And at the end of the day, I said, aren't you excited? He said, no. And I said, why? He said, I wanted a <laughs> rocket ship I could climb into. And so we spent the whole day kind of building something kind of of the wrong size. So, um, but, th but that, that was, that was really fun. You know, one of the things that's been most exciting just in general in building with the kids is mm -hmm. watching them get the confidence that whatever crazy idea they come up with, they can actually do. You know, it's, hmm. and it, it sounds kind of crazy, but there is this creative confidence that gets built over time where oh, yeah. at first you go there and, you know, you're not even sure you know how to, you know, put in a screw. And the more they do it, the more confidence they get that, you know, whatever they dream up and then whatever they model in CAD, they're going to be, they're going to be able to build this thing. So it's, hmm. uh, 
you know, now they're, they're both, they're both off at college. And so, uh, and they're, you know, both doing interesting stuff, but it was really watching them, you know, get that confidence that they, you know, that they could imagine stuff that you could come up with ideas that solve problems. Sometimes you could even solve things that haven't been done or you could just do it for fun. Like, you know, Willie's go-kart. I mean, we were just walking across the street one day and he said, you know, I'm tired of all this wood stuff. I want to build some stuff out of metal. I said, like, what? He said, an electric go-kart. I was like, where does that come from? So I've really liked watching them, you know, kind of get more capable, but, you know, more inspired and have a greater sense that whatever they come up with, they can actually build. Has that turned into them doing their own projects also? I mean, imagine so. Can you give a, a, an example of uh, some things that they've just gone off on their own? Yeah. So, um, well, Willie's, Willie's off to college now, you know, studying engineering. And uh, he's, mm-hmm. he's working on, he's a freshman, but he's working on the Baja team. And uh, nice. it was funny. He sent me some video the other day of one of the vehicles, you know, jumping over this, you know, these crazy dirt ramps that they had built. And I said, did mm-hmm. you just take a video or, you know, or have you gotten to drive it? <laughs> and he texted me back and he said, I, I've not only driven it, I've already rolled it once. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm texting with my wife. That's my boy. <laughs> I'm going... <laughs> Awesome. That sounds like right. And my wife said, if you stop a little bit on the awesome part of this and a little bit more, his mother loves him and wants him to be safe. <laughs> nah. well, I mean, it's, it's so inspirational. I mean, when we wa- I've, I've watched the prison- other presentations where you've talked about building the rocket ship and, and the go-kart uh, with your boys. And my, my thought when I watched you talking about it, because at the time you gave the presentations, you were still CEO of Autodesk. And I'm just thinking... How does this person run this multi-billion dollar behemoth and also have time to make this elaborate spaceship for for no his uh, for his young son <laughs> or with his young son? How, I mean, you you must have really strict time management skills or something. I mean, how, so one of the things how does that I, yeah, work for I you? mean, one of the things I was really happy about in all the years I worked at Autodesk, I was really happy about the thing of the way the kind of deal with the family was. I was, you know, I'd leave, I get up way early in the morning and I'd go off to work. I would try as many times as possible to be home for dinner. And, you know, and it was most of the time I was home for dinner and then we'd go to our separate corners and, you know, kids would do homework and I'd do email. And, uh, but, you know, generally from Friday night till Sunday night, I didn't do any, you know, I didn't do any work, you know, and so I used it and, you know, I, I built all this stuff with my kids. I coached their little league teams and basketball teams and stuff like that. And I just, that was, that was kind of, that was kind of the way I could do it. And so I was, I, I was really good about, you know, using the weekends just to do family stuff. You know, and, and looking back, I'm really glad Definitely. I did. And, you know, um, <laughs> I even, re- you know, and, you know, to coach things like little league, I, I remember the last mm-hmm. meeting of the day, mm-hmm. I would, I would often like, go into the bathroom and, you know, change into my coaching clothes and have the last minute so I could, so I could run out. You know, it's like my Superman trick. You know, run into the bathroom, put on my, you know, my shorts and my T-shirt and my hat. And, and then as soon as the meeting was over, I'd rush to the baseball field. So, I don't, you know, I don't regret, um, you know, one, any of the time I spent, you know, with my kids, you know, and if anything, I, if I had to do it over, I would spend more. And, you know, the truth is when you have a job like CEO of Autodesk or any other company, and I'd say, you know, many jobs, um, the maybe one of the biggest skills is actually managing your time. I mean, there was never a day that there weren't 10 things I could do that I couldn't get to. Uh, you know, it's an endless list of more stuff that you could do. Mm-hmm. And the whole trick is figuring out what do you really have to do and how, how important it is. And by the way, it's one, it's one of the most, it's one of the most liberating things about not having that right now. So the only things that intrude on my Uh, time are my my own, my own crazy ideas. Well, amidst all that, you, you, uh, also were also involved with other companies, um, advising and investing in some, uh, there's, there's tons developing cool products out there. And, uh, I think, here, uh, some of the latest you've been uh, advising Megabot, the Fighting Robot League. There's the other machine company that makes a 
really cool milling machine. What are some of those companies you're involved with? Uh, maybe some that we should check out. Yeah, the Megabots is cool. I mean, the, the two I've been spending the most time with lately, one is called Planet. Mm -hmm. It was formerly called Planet Labs. Do you know these guys? No. They're launching, um, they've launched a couple hundred satellites into space. And so they're building these little cube sets, you know, slightly bigger than a shoebox. And they're putting them up into uh -huh. space. And they're able to image the Earth every day. You're kidding. So what they've traded, they, what they've traded off is kind of like spatial resolution for temporal resolution. So they don't have, they're not as high res imagery as you might, as you might see in, you know, some of the other publicly available data sets. Um, mm -hmm. but, they, but at least it's up to date. It, and there's a lot you can learn by watching how things change on a daily basis. So shoebox sized satellites all around the, all around the world. And they, wow. they end up going up there as payload in, you know, all the rockets, you know, like they just one up and one from uh, Indian space agency, um, They've gone mm -hmm. up in the SpaceX ones. So they, they they just buy cargo space and put them up there and they launch it. And so it, it, it's, it's a very cool company. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a bunch of people who used to work at NASA and said instead of, you know, launching satellites that cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, we can put up these small ones and, you know, and they're they're benefiting by all the miniaturization and the commoditization of mm -hmm. stuff that goes in things like cell phones. And so they're able to put, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, building the satellites is relatively expensive, inexpensive. You know, still the most expensive part is getting them into space. But, um, yeah, check them out. They're, they're really fun. And the other company I've been spending a ton of time with is um, Zooks that's doing an autonomous vehicle. It's doing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a reimagined urban vehicle that's, you know, fully autonomous. So they're, they're definitely worth checking out as well. They're doing some really interesting stuff. I, I just want to ask a quick geek question. I, you know, one of the things that's been on my brain a lot lately, and I think a lot of people is, is this whole VR thing that's, that's really becoming, uh, well, it's not, it's being well, like, we're past peak hype for VR. I think, you know, all, all of the, uh, the initial wave is out. All the people that want the initial wave have already got it. Um, but I think there's a lot more interesting stuff happening behind the scenes and there are some really widely varying opinions about it. You know, people that are in the know have very different ideas about how much this will be useful and whether, you know, whether it will be useful at all and what it'll be used for. And I'm, I'm interested in it personally. Um, but I, you know, I, I just wonder what, what you think about it. Okay. So here's my, here's my thought. First of all, I think AR will be incredibly useful. So I think, you know, if you just take this notion of um, overlaying digital information onto the real world, I think that's incredibly interesting. And it's going to be a new way that we interact with the world. And, you, you know, just walk down the street, take out your phone, and you can learn more about the things you're looking at as an example. You know, if you get to the industrial use, you know, you pointed at the car engine you're working on and it tells you something about how to, you know, change the fuel injection system, you know, or whatever it is. Those kind of applications make sense. It's just a new way to interact with information to me. And I think we're at kind of the beginning of that. Um, but it feels like it's a really rich opportunity for change, changing how we interact with information in the world. Right. Absolutely. Your oh. VR one, I'm less certain. Um, you know, I've been, I've been continually pitched and continually disappointed by VR for the last 30 years. So, um, you know, and there is no doubt that things have gotten tremendously better. And the last few VR experiences I've had, uh, the two things I would say is the visual part of it is absolutely compelling. And I'm almost at the point of not getting nauseous. So mm. one is we got to get past the point where people get nauseous in these things. Um, if they're going to spend any mm. amount of time in it. And, you know, I do think some, some of the applications are actually getting interesting. So I was just at a, I, mean, I just happened to go visit a friend. We were going to go to dinner. And he's uh, redoing the uh, a new building for their company. And 
I walked in and there's a whole bunch of people in goggles imagining what the architecture of the place looks like after the renovation, even though we're still in the old place. Mm -hmm. And so you see that and you go, I totally get it. It makes sense. There's a way, you know, there's a sense of understanding that space better than many people would get by looking at renderings or looking at blueprints. Um, so, you know, there are training applications where I think it will make sense when the fidelity gets high enough. Um, so I think, I think there's a possibility. My, uh, my odds of it being, you know, a big success and, uh, you know, takes over the way we interact with computers is still fairly low. So, you know, if I was to read, let's say, you know, what's happening with, let's say, machine learning versus VR, you know, uh, I, I put, t you know, 10 to 1 or 100 to 1 on that uh, machine learning becomes just the bedrock of how computing is done in the future. I couldn't say that with nearly the same amount of certainty about VR being the way we interact with computers or, you know, with digital models in the future. Yeah, it seems it seems to me. So, so my kind of take on it is that the VR, that like there is nothing functional that VR gives you in terms of actual, um, uh, actual quantifiable benefit that you get from VR that you couldn't get on a rectangular screen. Like you can you can do all of the same things in pretty much the same way, and it's uh, it's you know it's it's not very different. The big difference is 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 a gut feeling. Right, the fact that you feel like you're in the space versus looking through Absolutely. a window at the space, yeah. and that's a and that's a very different thing. So, at, whereas with AR, you're taking that and you're saying, no, th this does have a functional, like I said, quantifiable benefit that right. you can use to display information that could not be displayed otherwise. So, so. VR is in this awkward place where it doesn't have any real tangible benefits, but it does have this feeling, this engrossing feeling that that is is really compelling on its own. It's just that I don't think anybody's yet figured out what why that matters. Well, I think it matters most in games. So you could imagine that the game, you know, the gaming experience is much more lifelike if you feel like you're in the game as opposed to watching it. Um, so I th I think there are some places like games where it makes total sense. As a matter of fact, the other day... And interior thought, design and architecture, yeah. like you're saying. Because yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you get a feeling, but, you know, it's it has it's still the technology has to get better. I did see something interesting, which was a, a small company that's developing some material that you could turn into clothes or gloves in which you can feel pressure and heat and cold. And that was really interesting. So I did a little... I did this little uh, demo in which I put out my hand and there was something, you know, on a screen, supposedly in front of me, and I could choose different animals and they would jump onto my hand. And so I would choose like a spider, and, you know, at one point there was a fire breathing dragon that <laughs> opened its mouth and my hand got hot. So there's no <laughs> doubt we're, we're going to be able to make these um, experiences more realistic. You know, you're going to get to the point where you can really trick your brain into thinking it. And if you've been in some of the good VR ones, I mean, you walk up to the edge of these things and you know you're in VR and you know you're in the room, but you can't take that next step over the edge. So it is doing, you know, it is doing mind tricks on you. There's no doubt about it. And that's going to become more compelling. I'm still with you on the, I don't see where it changes how we interact yet. Um, but so certainly in the architectural realm, certainly in some of these experiences, you've probably seen some of the work that they, they've done at Ford with understanding vehicles in a VR, you know, so people yeah, can Yeah, especially for large scale objects. It yeah. makes a ton of sense because you can really grok the scale mm -hmm. a lot more easily if it's in front of you. Yeah, you know, in interesting things mm -hmm. like line of sight and stuff, you can get a real sense. You know, when I turn over my shoulder to back up, can I see a kid, you know, running behind the car? And yes, you could do all the calculations. It's just something that, you know, as humans, we can process that information real easily and go, okay, this feels right, this feels wrong. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think there are marginal benefits. I don't think it's worthy of the hype yet. But AR, yeah, I'm a huge fan of, and, you know, I can see that getting better and better and just becoming just, you know, we won't even talk about AR. It just could become a natural way we interact with stuff. You know, and you, and you saw, you know, people in the beginning of even though, you know, it was a very failed experiment, things like Google Glass, you know, you could imagine from that experiment, um, 
how you might interact with the world in a different way. Well, you mix that with the machine learning and the go-kart project you're working on then also. And just, my goodness. Uh, you, uh, I saw somewhere you mentioned uh, you, you love to travel. You plan to travel uh, when uh, now that you have uh, some more time. I think last a uh, couple weeks ago you, you said you hit the slopes. Uh, so do you have any other uh, travel plans or uh, trips you like to take? I, I think the Bay Area. So one, we're having an epic year of snow in the Bay Area. You know, we're up in the oh, yeah. Sierras. You know, we, we've probably uh, already had 50 plus feet of snow. Wow. So, I mean, it's crazy up there. It's crazy. I was at my house the other day and I can't see out the first floor windows because there's too much snow outside of it. The snow <laughs> covers the first floor. Wow. Um, and that, and that's at the base of the mountain. Imagine what it's like at the top. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit more skiing. Uh, one of the things I want to do is, you know, um, when my time was more constrained, I couldn't have as much fun doing this. So I'm, I'm about to take a trip to Europe and I'm going to go look at a whole bunch of people who are doing some really interesting, uh, the two things I'm looking at are, I mean, this is in general, what I've been playing with is combination of machine learning and digital fabrication. And so I'm going to a number of places to visit and check out and, you know, uh, spend more relaxed time you know, understanding what's going mm-hmm. on with a bunch of these people. Also, you know, um, um, going to look at a couple of startups in Europe as well. So, uh, so again, the, you know, the Europe, area Europe, 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 Europe's on my list. Um, I've always wanted to go to like um, places like Fiji, and I've, and I've never done that. Oh yeah, nice. Oh, oh, hopefully, hopefully. Hopefully this year I'll get back. I used to windsurf a lot, and now I want I, I want to do some kite sailing. So that looks so fun. I'm looking. I'm looking for a nice warm place to learn. You know, I, I windsurfed in the bay all the time, but you know that's wetsuit and yeah, that's yeah. A, but of course, Carl Bass isn't going to go isn't going to go kiteboarding without having made his own kite and board and. Yeah, of course not. Yeah. Eventually, it will get to that. It will get to that. <laughs> All right. Well, when it does, we'll be sure to let everybody know about it. Okay, good. So can we see, are you going to be at the Bay Area Maker Fair uh, coming up in May? Will yeah, I'm, I'm we be out there? I've been there almost every year. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure I'll go again. Um, and again, yeah, all these things, you know, they used to, they used to feel like a luxury, you know, just um, trying to squeeze them in with all the other time commitments. But now, now I can go mm-hmm. enjoy myself. Are you guys going? Well, we'll try to be represented one way or another. I'd yeah. love to. I haven't been out to the Bay Area one. Well, if you come out that w- if you come out that week, let me know, and we can def- we can definitely do the shop tour. Fantastic. Well, Excellent. Mr. Carl Bass, thank you so much for being on with us today. I really appreciate your time, uh, especially given how little of it I know you have, even though you say you have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've I've emphasized that quite a bit. Yeah, I? you talked about that so, quite a bit, but I yeah, don't quite totally believe you. But it's okay. It's good talking to you guys. No, one one <laughs> of the things, one of the things I was going to tell you was um, one of the other things I get to do these days is I'm actually using I'm using my software, you know, that I worked on before way more than ever before. Uh-huh. So so that that that's actually oh, wow. fun. So I've actually I've actually had a good time enjoying you know the fruits of all that labor. So that's been really exciting. Yeah. We didn't even think about that, but yeah, you have time to actually use the software you've been building all these. Uh, years. Yeah, no, I've been having I've been having some funny experiences. Number one is, uh, um, you know, for that big uh, for that big press break. So I've been using all this new mm-hmm. sheet metal stuff in Fusion, and uh, driving you know driving uh-huh. all the guys at work, driving all the guys at work crazy, going, "No, oh, it's got to do this, it's got to do this, it's got to do that." And so, uh, <laughs> what? Why don't you go learn how to use Revit or something? <laughs> um, and so they're like, why don't you, you do a construction project instead of a sheet metal project? So that's been fun. The, the, the other one is uh, Willie is off at college and he's uh, he's learning how to use SolidWorks. So I, I, I keep on growing. <laughs> oh. Whoa, 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 what he likes better between SolidWorks and Fusion. So there, are good, there are good days and bad days in, the, in those conversations. So that's been, that's. Been <laughs> nice. But anyhow, <laughs> well, well that's anyhow, good to talk to you guys. And if you come out, I'd be happy to show you around, and hopefully, 
My robots will be a little bit more capable by the time you get here. Can't wait. A production of EBD Media. EBD Media.